Chapter Nine of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. I appear in a manner becoming my name, and lineage. Fortune, smiling at parting upon Monsieur de Balibary, enabled him to win a handsome sum with his faro bank. At ten o'clock the next morning the carriage of the chevalier de balibary drew up as usual at the door of his hotel and the chevalier who was at his window seeing the chariot arrive came down the stairs in his usual stately manner where is my rascal ambrose said he looking around and not finding his servant to open the door i will let down the steps for your honour said a gendarme who was standing by the carriage and no sooner had the chevalier entered than the officer jumped in after him another mounted the box by the coachman and the latter began to drive good gracious said the chevalier what is this you're going to drive to the frontier said the gendarme touching his hat it is shameful infamous i insist upon being put down at the austrian ambassador's house i have orders to gag your honour if you cry out said the gendarme all europe shall hear of this said the chevalier in a fury as you please answered the officer and then both relapsed into silence the silence was not broken between berlin and potsdam through which place the chevalier passed as his majesty was reviewing the guards there and the regiments of bulow zitwitz and henkel de donnersmark as the chevalier passed his majesty the king raised his hat and said qu'il ne descend pas je lui souhaite un bon voyage the chevalier de balibary acknowledged this courtesy by a profound bow they had not got far beyond potsdam when boom the alarm cannon began to roar it is a deserter said the officer is it possible said the chevalier and sank back into his carriage again hearing the sound of the guns the common people came out along the road with fowling pieces and pitchforks in hopes to catch the truant the gendarme seemed very anxious to be on the lookout for him too the price of the deserter was fifty crowns to those who brought him in confess sir said the chevalier to the police officer in the carriage with him that you long to be rid of me from whom you can get nothing and to be on the lookout for the deserter who may bring you in fifty crowns why not tell the postilion to push on you may land me at the frontier and get back to your hunt all the sooner the officer told the postilion to get on but the way seemed intolerably long to the chevalier once or twice he thought he heard the noise of horse galloping behind his own horses did not seem to go two miles an hour but they did go the black and white barriers came in view at last hard by brook and beyond them the green and yellow of saxony the saxon custom-house officers came out i have no luggage said the chevalier the gentleman has nothing contraband said the prussian officers grinning and took their leave of their prisoner with much respect the chevalier de balibary gave them a frederick apiece gentlemen he said i wish you a good day will you please to go to the house whence we set out this morning and tell my man there to send on my baggage to the three kings at dresden then ordering fresh horses the chevalier set off on his journey for that capital i need not tell you that i was the chevalier from the chevalier de balibary to redmond berry esq gentil anglais à l'hôtel des trois couronnes à dresde en saxe nephew redmond this comes to you by a sure hand no other than mr lumpet of the english mission who is acquainted as all berlin will be directly with our wonderful story 
they only know half as yet they only know that a deserter went off in my clothes and all are in admiration of your cleverness and valour i confess that for two hours after your departure i lay in bed in no small trepidation thinking whether his majesty might have a fancy to send me to spandau for the freak of which we had both been guilty but in that case i had taken my precautions i had written a statement of the case to my chief the austrian minister with the full and true story of how you had been set to spy upon me how you turned out to be my very near relative how you had been kidnapped yourself into the service and how we both had determined to effect your escape the laugh would have been so much against the king that he never would have dared to lay a finger upon me what would m de voltaire have said to such an act of tyranny but it was a lucky day and everything has turned out to my wish as i lay in my bed two and a half hours after your departure in comes your ex-captain potsdorf redmond says he in his imperious high dutch way are you there no answer the rogue is gone out said he and straightway makes for my red box where i keep my love letters my glass eye which i used to wear my favourite lucky dice with which i threw the thirteen mains at prague my two sets of paris teeth and my other private matters that you know of he first tried a bunch of keys but none of them would fit the little english lock then my gentleman takes out of his pocket a chisel and hammer and falls to work like a professional burglar actually bursting open my little box now is my time to act i advance towards him armed with an immense water jug i come noiselessly up to him just as he had broken the box and with all my might i deal him such a blow over the head as smashes the water jug to atoms and sends my captain with a snort lifeless to the ground i thought i'd kill them then i ring all the bells in the house and shout and swear and scream thieves thieves landlord murder fire until the whole household came tumbling up the stairs where's my servant roar i who dares to rob me in open day look at the villain whom i find in the act of breaking my chest open send for the police send for his excellency the austrian minister all europe shall know of this insult dear heaven says the landlord we saw you go away three hours ago me says i why man i have been in bed all the morning i am ill i have taken physic i have not left the house this morning where is that scoundrel ambrose but stop where are my clothes and wig for i was standing before them in my chamber gown and stockings with my nightcap on i have it i have it says the little chambermaid ambrose is off in your honour's dress and my money my money says i where is my purse with forty-eight fredericks in it but we have one of the villains left officers seize him it's the young herr von potsdorf says the landlord more and more astonished what a gentleman breaking open my trunk with hammer and chisel impossible herr von potsdorf was returning to life by this time with a swelling on his skull as big as a saucepan and the officers carried him off and the judge who was sent for dressed a procès verbal of the matter and i demanded a copy of it which i sent forthwith to my ambassador i was kept a prisoner to my room the next day and a judge a general and a host of lawyers officers and officials were set upon me to bully perplex threaten and cajole me i said it was true you had told me that you had been kidnapped into the service that i thought you were released from it and that i had you with the best recommendations i appealed to my minister who was bound to come to my aid and to make a long story short poor potsdorf is now on his way to spandau and his uncle the elder potsdorf has brought me five hundred louis with a humble request that i would leave berlin forthwith and hush up this painful matter 
I shall be with you at the Three Crowns the day after you receive this. Ask Mr. Lumpet to dinner. Do not spare your money. You are my son. Everybody in Dresden knows your loving uncle, the Chevalier de Balibarie. And by these wonderful circumstances I was once more free again, and I kept my resolution then made never to fall more into the hands of any recruiter, and henceforth and for ever to be a gentleman. With this sum of money, and a good run of luck which ensued presently, we were able to make no ungenteel figure. My uncle speedily joined me at the inn at Dresden, where, under the pretense of illness, I had kept quiet until his arrival, and, as the Chevalier de Balipari was in particular good odour at the court of Dresden, having been an intimate acquaintance of the late monarch, the elector, king of Poland, the most dissolute and agreeable of European princes, I was speedily in the very best society of the Saxon capital where I may say that my own person and manners, and the singularity of the adventures in which I had been a hero, made me especially welcome. There was not a party of the nobility to which the two gentlemen of Balipari were not invited. I had the honour of kissing hands, and being graciously received at court by the elector, and I wrote home to my mother such a flaming description of my prosperity that the good soul very nearly forgot her celestial welfare and her confessor, the Reverend Joshua Jowles, in order to come after me to Germany. But travelling was very difficult in those days, and so we were spared the arrival of the good lady. I think the soul of Harry Berry, my father, who was always so genteel in his turn of mind, must have rejoiced to see the position which I now occupied. All the women anxious to receive me, all the men in a fury, hobnobbing with dukes and counts at supper, dancing minuets with high, well-born baronesses, as they absurdly call themselves in Germany, with lovely excellencies, nay, with highnesses and transparencies themselves. Who could compete with the gallant Irish noble? Who would suppose that seven weeks before I had been a common... Bah, I'm ashamed to think of it. One of the pleasantest moments of my life was at a grand gala at the Electoral Palace, where I had the honour of walking a Polonaise, with no other than the Margravine of Byright, old Fritz's own sister. Old Fritz, whose hateful blue blaze livery I had worn, whose belts I had pipe-clayed, and whose abominable rations of small beer and sauerkraut I had swallowed for five years. Having won an English chariot from an Italian gentleman at play, my uncle had our arms painted on the panels in a more splendid way than ever, surmounted, as we were descended from the ancient kings, with an Irish crown of the most splendid size and gilding. I have this crown in lieu of a coronet engraved on a large amethyst signet ring worn on my forefinger and I don't mind confessing that I used to say the jewel had been in my family for several thousand years, having originally belonged to my direct ancestor, His Late Majesty King Brian Boru, or Barry. I warrant the legends of the Herald's College are not more authentic than mine was. At first the minister and the gentleman at the English hotel used to be rather shy of us two Irish noblemen and questioned our pretensions to rank. The minister was a lord's son, it is true, but he was likewise a grocer's grandson. And so I told him at Count Lobkowitz's masquerade. My uncle, like a noble gentleman as he was, knew the pedigree of every considerable family in Europe. He said it was the only knowledge befitting a gentleman, and when we were not at cards, we would pass hours over Guillaume or Dozier, reading the genealogies, learning the blazons, and making ourselves acquainted with the relationships of our class. Alas, the noble science is going into disrepute now. So are cards, without which studies and pastimes 
I can hardly conceive how a man of honor can exist. My first affair of honor with a man of undoubted fashion was on the score of my nobility, with young Sir Rumford Bumford of the English Embassy, my uncle at the same time sending a cartel to the minister who declined to come. I shot Sir Rumford in the leg, amidst the tears of joy of my uncle who accompanied me to the ground, and I promise you that none of the young gentlemen questioned the authenticity of my pedigree, or laughed at my Irish crown again. What a delightful life did we now lead! I knew I was born to be a gentleman, from the kindly way in which I took to the business, as business it certainly is. For though it seems all pleasure, yet I assure any low-bred persons who may chance to read this, that we, their betters, have to work as well as they. Though I did not rise until noon, yet had I not been up at play until long past midnight? Many a time we have come home to bed as the troops were marching out to early parade, and oh, it did my heart good to hear the bugles blowing the reveille before daybreak or to see the regiments marching out to exercise, and think that I was no longer bound to that disgusting discipline, but restored to my natural station. I came into it at once, and as if I had never done anything else all my life. I had a gentleman to wait upon me, a French friseur to dress my hair of a morning. I knew the taste of chocolate, as by intuition almost, and could distinguish between the right Spanish and the French before I had been a week in my new position. I had rings on all my fingers, watches in both my fobs, canes, trinkets, and snuff-boxes of all sorts, and each outvying the other in elegance. I had the finest natural taste for lace and china of any man I ever knew, and I could judge a horse as well as any Jew dealer in Germany. In shooting and athletic exercises I was unrivaled. I could not spell but I could speak German and French cleverly. I had at the least twelve suits of clothes, three richly embroidered with gold, two laced with silver, a garnet-colored velvet pelisse lined with sable, one of French gray, silver-laced, and lined with chinchilla. I had damask morning robes. I took lessons on the guitar and sang French catches exquisitely. Where, in fact, was there a more accomplished gentleman than Redmond de Ballybarry? All the luxuries becoming my station could not, of course, be purchased without credit and money, to procure which, as our patrimony had been wasted by our ancestors, and we were above the vulgarity and slow returns and doubtful chances of trade, my uncle kept a faro bank we were in partnership with a florentine well known in all the courts of europe the count alessandro pipi as skilful a player as ever was seen but he turned out a sad knave latterly and i have discovered that his countship was a mere imposture my uncle was maimed as i have said pipi like all impostors was a coward it was my unrivalled skill with the sword and readiness to use it that maintained the reputation of the firm, so to speak, and silenced many a timid gambler who might have hesitated to pay his losings. We always played on parole with anybody, any person, that is, of honor and noble lineage. We never pressed for our winnings or declined to receive promissory notes in lieu of gold. But woe to the man who did not pay when the note became due, Redmond de Ballybarry was sure to wait upon him with his bill, and I promise you there were very few bad debts. On the contrary, gentlemen were grateful to us for our forbearance, and our character for honor stood unimpeached. In later times, a vulgar national prejudice has chosen to cast a slur upon the character of men of honor engaged in the profession of play. But I speak of the good old days in Europe before the cowardice of the French aristocracy, in the shameful revolution which served them right, 
brought discredit and ruin upon our order. They cry fie now upon men engaged in play, but I should like to know how much more honorable their modes of livelihood are than ours. The broker of the exchange, who bulls and bears and buys and sells and dabbles with lying loans and trades on state secrets, what is he but a gamester? The merchant who deals in teas and tallows, is he any better? His bales of dirty indigo are his dice, his cards come up every year instead of every ten minutes, and the sea is his green table. You call the profession of the law an honorable one, where a man will lie for any bidder, lie down poverty for the sake of a fee from wealth, lie down right because wrong is in his brief. You call a doctor an honorable man? a swindling quack who does not believe in the nostrums which he prescribes and takes your guinea for whispering in your ear that it is a fine morning and yet forsooth a gallant man who sits down before the bays and challenges all comers his money against theirs his fortune against theirs is prescribed by your modern moral world it is a conspiracy of the middle classes against gentlemen. It is only the shopkeeper cant which is to go down nowadays. I say that play was an institution of chivalry. It has been wrecked along with other privileges of men of birth. When St. Galt engaged a man for six and thirty hours without leaving the table, do you think he showed no courage? How have we had the best blood? the brightest eyes, too, of Europe, throbbing round the table, as I and my uncle have held the cards and the bank against some terrible player who was matching some thousands out of his millions against our all which was there on the bays. When we engaged that daring Alexis Koslovsky and won seven thousand louis in a single coup, had we lost, we should have been beggars the next day. When he lost, he was only a village and a few hundred serfs in pawn the worse when at teplitz the duke of courland brought fourteen lackeys each with four bags of florins and challenged our bank to play against the sealed bags what did we ask sir said we we have but eighty thousand florins in bank or two hundred thousands at three months if your highness's bags do not contain more than eighty thousand we will meet you and we did, and after eleven hours' play, in which our bank was at one time reduced to two hundred and three ducats, we won seventeen thousand florins of him. Is this not something like boldness? Does this profession not require skill and perseverance and bravery? Four crowned heads looked on at the game, and an imperial princess, when I turned up the ace of hearts and made Paroli burst into tears. No man on the European continent held a higher position than Redmond Barry then. And when the Duke of Courland lost, he was pleased to say that we had won nobly, and so we had, and spent nobly what we won. At this period my uncle, who attended Mass every day regularly, always put ten florins into the box. Wherever we went, the tavern-keepers made us more welcome than royal princes. We used to give away the broken meat from our suppers and dinners to scores of beggars who blessed us. Every man who held my horse or cleaned my boots got a ducat for his pains. I was, I may say, the author of our common good fortune, by putting boldness into our play. Peepy was a faint-hearted fellow, who was always cowardly when he began to win. My uncle, I speak with great respect of him, was too much of a devotee and too much of a martinet at play ever to win greatly. His moral courage was unquestionable, but his daring was not sufficient. Both of these my seniors very soon acknowledged me to be their chief, and hence the style of splendor I have described. 
I have mentioned Her Imperial Highness the Princess Frederica Amelia, who was affected by my success, and shall always think with gratitude of the protection with which that exalted lady honoured me. She was passionately fond of play, as indeed were the ladies of almost all the courts of Europe in those days, and hence would often arise no small trouble to us, for the truth must be told that ladies love play, certainly, but not to pay. The point of honour is not understood by the charming sex, and it was with the greatest difficulty in our peregrinations to the various courts of northern Europe that we could keep them from the table, could get their money if they lost, or, if they paid, prevent them from using the most furious and extraordinary means of revenge. In those great days of our fortune, I calculate that we lost no less than fourteen thousand louis by such failures of payment. A princess of a ducal house gave us paste instead of diamonds, which she had solemnly pledged to us. Another organized a robbery of the crown jewels, and would have charged the theft upon us but for Peepy's caution, who had kept back a note of hand her high transparency gave us, and sent it to his ambassador by which precaution I do believe our necks were saved. A third lady of high, but not princely, rank, after I had won a considerable sum in diamonds and pearls from her, sent her lover with a band of cutthroats to waylay me, and it was only by extraordinary courage, skill, and good luck that I escaped from these villains, wounded myself, but leaving the chief aggressor dead on the ground. My sword entered his eye and broke there, and the villains who were with him fled, seeing their chief fall. They might have finished me else, for I had no weapon of defense. Thus it will be seen that our life, for all its splendor, was of extreme danger and difficulty, requiring high talents and courage for success, and often when we were in a full vein of success, we were suddenly driven from our ground on account of some freak of a reigning prince, some intrigue of a disappointed mistress, or some quarrel with the police minister. If the latter personage were not bribed or won over, nothing was more common than for us to receive a sudden order of departure. And so, perforce, we lived a wandering and desultory life. Though the gains of such a life are, as I have said, very great, yet the expenses are enormous. Our appearance and retinue was too splendid for the narrow mind of Peepy, who was always crying out at my extravagance, though obliged to own that his own meanness and parsimony would never have achieved the great victories which my generosity had won. With all our success, our capital was not very great, that speech to the Duke of Courland, for instance, was a mere boast, as far as the almost two hundred thousand florins at three months were concerned. We had no credit, and no money beyond that on our table, and should have been forced to fly if His Highness had won and accepted our bills. Sometimes, too, we were hit very hard. A bank is a certainty, almost, but now and then a bad day will come and men who have the courage of good fortune, at least, ought to meet bad luck well. The former, believe me, is the harder task of the two. One of these evil chances befell us in the Duke of Baden's territory, at Mannheim. Peepy, who was always on the lookout for business, offered to make a bank at the inn where we were put up, and where the officers of the Duke's cuirassiers supped and some small play accordingly took place, and some wretched crowns and louis changed hands. I trust rather to the advantage of these poor gentlemen of the army, who are surely the poorest of all devils under the sun. But, as ill luck would have it, a couple of young students from the neighboring University of Heidelberg, who had come to Mannheim for their quarter's revenue, and so had some hundred of dollars between them, were introduced to the table, and, having never played before, began to win, as is always the case. As ill luck would have it, too, they were tipsy, and against tipsiness I have often found the best calculations of play fail entirely. 
they played in the most perfectly insane way and yet always won for every card they backed turned up in their favor they had won a hundred louis from us in ten minutes and seeing that peepy was growing angry and the luck against us i was for shutting up the bank for the night saying the play was only meant for a joke and that now we had had enough but peepy who had quarrelled with me that day was determined to proceed and the upshot was that the students played and won more then they lent money to the officers who began to win too and in this ignoble way in a tavern room thick with tobacco smoke across a deal table besmeared with beer and liquor and to a parcel of hungry subalterns and a pair of beardless students three of the most skilful and renowned players in europe lost seventeen hundred louis i blush now when i think of it it was like charles the twelfth or richard coeur de lion falling before a petty fortress and an unknown hand as my friend mr johnson wrote and was in fact a most shameful defeat nor was this the only defeat when our poor conquerors had gone off bewildered with the treasure which fortune had flung in their way one of these students was called the baron de clutz perhaps he who afterwards lost his head at paris peepy resumed the quarrel of the morning and some exceedingly high words passed between us among other things i recollect i knocked him down with a stool and was for flinging him out of the window but my uncle who was cool and had been keeping lent with his usual solemnity interposed between us and a reconciliation took place peepy apologizing and confessing he had been wrong i ought to have doubted however the sincerity of the treacherous italian indeed as i never before believed a word that he said in his life i know not why i was so foolish as to credit him now and go to bed leaving the keys of our cash-box with him it contained after our loss to the cuirassiers in bills and money near upon eight thousand pounds sterling peepy insisted that our reconciliation should be ratified over a bowl of hot wine and i have no doubt put some soporific drug into the liquor for my uncle and i both slept till very late the next morning and woke with violent headaches and fever we did not quit our beds till noon he had been gone twelve hours leaving our treasury empty and behind him a sort of calculation by which he strove to make out that this was his share of the profits and that all the losses had been incurred without his consent thus after eighteen months we had to begin the world again but was i cast down no our wardrobes were still worth a very large sum of money for gentlemen did not dress like parish clerks in those days and a person of fashion would often wear a suit of clothes and a set of ornaments that would be a shop-boy's fortune so without repining for one single minute or saying a single angry word my uncle's temper in this respect was admirable or allowing the secret of our loss to be known to a mortal soul we pawned three-fourths of our jewels and clothes to moses low the banker and with the produce of our sale and our private pocket money amounting in all to something less than eight hundred louis we took the field again end of chapter nine chapter ten of the memoirs of barry linden esq by william makepeace thackeray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, More Runs of Luck. I am not going to entertain my readers with an account of my professional career as a gamester, any more than I did with anecdotes of my life as a military man. I might fill volumes with tales of this kind were I so minded, but at this rate my recital would not be brought to a conclusion for years and who knows how soon i may be called upon to stop i have gout rheumatism gravel and a disordered liver i have two or three wounds in my body which break out every now and then and give me intolerable pain 
and a hundred more signs of breaking up. Such are the effects of time, illness, and free living upon one of the strongest constitutions and finest forms the world ever saw. Ah, I suffered from none of these ills in the year sixty-six, when there was no man in Europe more gay in spirits, more splendid in personal accomplishments, than young Redmond Barry. Before the treachery of the scoundrel Peepy, I had visited many of the best courts of Europe, especially the smaller ones where play was patronized, and the professors of that science always welcome. Among the ecclesiastical principalities of the Rhine we were particularly well received. I never knew finer or gayer courts than those of the electors of Treves and Cologne, where there was more splendor and gaiety than at Vienna, far more than in the wretched barrack court of Berlin. The court of the Archduchess Governess of the Netherlands was likewise a royal place for us knights of the dice-box and gallant votaries of fortune, whereas in the stingy Dutch or the beggarly Swiss republics it was impossible for a gentleman to gain a livelihood unmolested. After our mishap at Mannheim, my uncle and I made for the Duchy of X. The reader may find out the place easily enough but I do not choose to print at full the names of some illustrious persons in whose society I then fell, and among whom I was made the sharer in a very strange and tragical adventure. There was no court in Europe at which strangers were more welcome than that of the noble Duke of X. None where pleasure was more eagerly sought after and more splendidly enjoyed. The prince did not inhabit his capital of S, but, imitating in every respect the ceremonial of the court of Versailles, built himself a magnificent palace at a few leagues from his chief city, and round about his palace a superb aristocratic town, inhabited entirely by his nobles and the officers of his sumptuous court. The people were rather hardly pressed, to be sure, in order to keep up this splendor, for his highness's dominions were small, and so he wisely lived in a sort of awful retirement from them, seldom showing his face in his capital, or seeing any countenances but those of his faithful domestics and officers. His palace and gardens of Ludwigslust were exactly on the French model. Twice a week there were court receptions and grand court galas twice a month. There was the finest opera out of France, and a ballet unrivaled in splendor on which His Highness, a great lover of music and dancing, expended prodigious sums. It may be because I was then young, but I think I never saw such an assemblage of brilliant beauty as used to figure there on the stage of the court theatre, in the grand mythological ballets which were then the mode and in which you saw Mars in red-heeled pumps and a periwig, and Venus in patches and a hoop. They say the costume was incorrect and have changed it since. But for my part, I have never seen a Venus more lovely than the Coralie, who was the chief dancer, and found no fault with the attendant nymphs in their trains and lappets and powder. These operas used to take place twice a week, after which some great officer of the court would have his evening and his brilliant supper, and the dice-box rattled everywhere and all the world played. I have seen seventy play-tables set out in the grand gallery of Ludwigslust, besides the Pharaoh-bank, where the duke himself would graciously come and play, and win or lose with a truly royal splendor. It was hither we came after the Mannheim misfortune. The nobility of the court were pleased to say our reputation had preceded us, and the two Irish gentlemen were made welcome. The very first night at court we lost 740 of our 800 louis. The next evening at the court marshal's table I won them back with 1300 more. You may be sure we allowed no one to know how near we were to ruin on the first evening, but, on the contrary, I endeared every one to me by my gay manner of losing and the finance minister himself cashed a note for four hundred ducats, drawn by me upon my steward of Ballyberry Castle in the Kingdom of Ireland, 
which very note i won from his excellency the next day along with a considerable sum in ready cash in that noble court everybody was a gambler you would see the lackeys in the ducal anterooms at work with their dirty packs of cards the coach and chairman playing in the court while their masters were punting the saloons above the very cookmaids and scullions i was told had a bank where one of them an italian confectioner made a handsome fortune he purchased afterwards a roman marquisate and his son has figured as one of the most fashionable of the illustrious foreigners in london the poor devils of soldiers played away their pay when they got it which was seldom and i don't believe there was an officer in any one of the guard regiments but had his cards in his pouch and no more forgot his dice than his sword knot among such fellows it was diamond cut diamond what you call fair play would have been a folly the gentlemen of ballyberry would have been fools indeed to appear as pigeons in such a hawk's nest none but men of courage and genius could live and prosper in a society where every one was bold and clever and here my uncle and i held our own ay and more than our own his highness the duke was a widower or rather since the death of the reigning duchess had contracted a morganatic marriage with a lady whom he had ennobled and who considered it a compliment such was the morality of those days to be called the northern du barry he had been married very young and his son the hereditary prince may be said to have been the political sovereign of the state for the reigning duke was fonder of pleasure than of politics and loved to talk a great deal more with his grand huntsman or the director of his opera than with ministers and ambassadors the hereditary prince whom i shall call prince victor was of a very different character from his august father he had made the wars of the succession and seven years with great credit in the empress's service was of a stern character seldom appeared at court except when ceremony called him but lived alone in his wing of the palace where he devoted himself to the severest studies being a great astronomer and chemist he shared in the rage then common throughout europe of hunting for the philosopher's stone and my uncle often regretted that he had no smattering of chemistry like balsamo who called himself cagliostro saint germain and other individuals who had obtained very great sums from duke victor by aiding him in his search after the great secret his amusements were hunting and reviewing the troops but for him and if his good-natured father had not had his aid the army would have been playing at cards all day and so it was well that the prudent prince was left to govern duke victor was fifty years of age and his princess the princess olivia was scarce three-and-twenty they had been married seven years and in the first years of their union the princess had borne him a son and a daughter the stern morals and manners the dark and ungainly appearance of the husband were little likely to please the brilliant and fascinating young woman who had been educated in the south she was connected with the ducal house of s who had passed two years at paris under the guardianship of mesdames the daughters of his most christian majesty and who was the life and soul of the court of x the gayest of the gay the idol of her august father-in-law and indeed of the whole court she was not beautiful but charming not witty but charming too in her conversation as in her person she was extravagant beyond all measure so false that you could not trust her but her very weakness was more winning than the virtues of other women her selfishness more delightful than others' generosity. I never knew a woman whose faults made her so attractive. She used to ruin people, and yet they all loved her. My old uncle has seen her cheating at Ombre, and let her win four hundred louis without resisting in the least. Her caprices with the officers and ladies of her household were ceaseless, but they adored her. 
she was the only one of the reigning family whom the people worshipped she never went abroad but they followed her carriage with shouts of acclamation and to be generous to them she would borrow the last penny from one of her poor maids of honour whom she would never pay in the early days her husband was as much fascinated by her as all the rest of the world was but her caprices had caused frightful outbreaks of temper on his part and an estrangement which though interrupted by almost mad returns of love was still general i speak of her royal highness with perfect candour and admiration although i might be pardoned for judging her more severely considering her opinion of myself she said the elder monsieur de barry was a finished old gentleman and the younger one had the manners of a courier the world has given a different opinion and i can afford to chronicle this almost single sentence against me besides she had a reason for her dislike to me which you shall hear five years in the army long experience in the world had ere now dispelled any of those romantic notions regarding love with which i commenced life and i had determined as is proper with gentlemen it is only your low people who marry for mere affection to consolidate my fortunes by marriage in the course of our peregrinations my uncle and i had made several attempts to carry this object into effect but numerous disappointments had occurred which are not worth mentioning here and had prevented me hitherto from making such a match as i thought was worthy of a man of my birth abilities and personal appearance ladies are not in the habit of running away on the continent as is the custom in england a custom whereby many honourable gentlemen of my country have much benefited guardians and ceremonies and difficulties of all kinds interfere true love is not allowed to have its course and poor women cannot give away their honest hearts to the gallant fellows who have won them now it was settlements that were asked for now it was my pedigree and title deeds that were not satisfactory though i had a plan and rent roll of the ballyberry estates and the genealogy of my family up to king brian boru or barry most handsomely designed on paper now it was a young lady who was whisked off to a convent just as she was ready to fall into my arms on another occasion when a rich widow of the low countries was about to make me a lord of a noble estate in flanders comes an order of the police which drives me out of brussels at an hour's notice and consigns my mourner to her chateau but at x i had an opportunity of playing a great game and won it too but for the dreadful catastrophe which upset my fortune in the household of the hereditary princess there was a lady nineteen years of age and possessor of the greatest fortune in the whole duchy the countess ida such was her name was daughter of a late minister and favourite of his highness the duke of x and his duchess who had done her the honour to be her sponsors at birth and who at the father's death had taken her under their august guardianship and protection at sixteen she was brought from her castle where up to that period she had been permitted to reside and had been placed with the princess olivia as one of her highness's maids of honour the aunt of the countess ida who presided over her house during her minority had foolishly allowed her to contract an attachment for her cousin german a penniless sub-lieutenant in one of the duke's foot regiments who had flattered himself to be able to carry off this rich prize and if he had not been a blundering silly idiot indeed with the advantage of seeing her constantly of having no rival near him and the intimacy attendant upon close kinsmanship might easily by a private marriage have secured the young countess and her possessions but he managed matters so foolishly that he allowed her to leave her retirement to come to court for a year and take her place in the princess olivia's household and then what does my young gentleman do but appear at the duke's levee one day in his tarnished epaulette and threadbare coat and make an application in due form to his highness as the young lady's guardian for the hand of the richest heiress in his dominions 
the weakness of the good-natured prince was such that as the countess ida herself was quite as eager for the match as her silly cousin her highness might have been induced to allow the match had not the princess olivia been induced to interpose and to procure from the duke a peremptory veto to the hopes of the young man the cause of this refusal was as yet unknown no other suitor for the young lady's hand was mentioned and the lovers continued to correspond hoping that time might effect a change in his highness's resolutions when of a sudden the lieutenant was drafted into one of the regiments which the prince was in the habit of selling to the great powers then at war this military commerce was a principal part of his highness's and other princes revenues in those days and their connection was thus abruptly broken off it was strange that the princess olivia should have taken this part against a young lady who had been her favourite for at first with those romantic and sentimental notions which almost every woman has she had somewhat encouraged the countess ida and her penniless lover but now suddenly turned against them and from loving the countess as she previously had done pursued her with every manner of hatred which a woman knows how to inflict there was no end to the ingenuity of her tortures the venom of her tongue the bitterness of her sarcasm and scorn when i at first came to court at x the young fellows there had nicknamed the young lady the duma Griffin, the stupid countess she was generally silent handsome but pale stolid looking and awkward taking no interest in the amusements of the place and appearing in the midst of the feasts as glum as the death's head which they say the romans used to have at their tables it was rumoured that a young gentleman of french extraction the chevalier de magny equerry to the hereditary prince and present at paris when the princess olivia was married to him by proxy there was the intended of the rich countess ida but no official declaration of the kind was yet made and there were whispers of a dark intrigue which subsequently received frightful confirmation the chevalier de magny was the grandson of an old officer in the duke's service the baron de magny the baron's father had quitted france at the expulsion of protestants after the revocation of the edict of nantes and taken service in aix where he died the son succeeded him and quite unlike most french gentlemen of birth whom i have known was a stern and cold calvinist rigid in the performance of his duty retiring in his manners mingling little with the court and a close friend and favourite of duke victor whom he resembled in disposition the chevalier his grandson was a true frenchman he had been born in france where his father held a diplomatic appointment in the duke's service he had mingled in the gay society of the most brilliant court in the world and had endless stories to tell us of the pleasures of the petite maison of the secrets of the parc aux cerfs and of the wild gaieties of richelieu and his companions he had been almost ruined at play as his father had been before him for out of the reach of the stern old baron in germany both son and grandson had led the most reckless of lives he had come back from paris soon after the embassy which had been dispatched thither on the occasion of the marriage of the princess was received sternly by his old grandfather who however paid his debts once more and procured him the post in the duke's household the chevalier de magny rendered himself a great favourite of his august master he brought with him the modes and gaieties of paris he was the deviser of all the masquerades and balls the recruiter of the ballet dancers and by far the most brilliant and splendid young gentleman of the court after we had been a few weeks at ludwigslust the old baron de magny endeavoured to have us dismissed from the duchy but his voice was not strong enough to overcome that of the general public and the chevalier de magny especially stood our friend with his highness when the question was debated before him the chevalier's love of play had not deserted him he was a regular frequenter of our bank where he played for some time with pretty good luck and where when he began to lose 
he paid with a regularity surprising to all those who knew the smallness of his means and the splendor of his appearance her highness the princess olivia was also very fond of play on half a dozen occasions when we held a banquet court i could see her passion for the game i could see that is my cool-headed old uncle could see much more there was an intelligence between monsieur de Magny and this illustrious lady if her highness be not in love with the little frenchman my uncle said to me one night after play may i lose the sight of my last eye and what then sir said i what then said my uncle looking me hard in the face are you so green as not to know what then your fortune is to be made if you choose to back it now and we may have back the Berry estates in two years my boy how's that said i still at a loss my uncle dryly said get Magny to play never mind his paying take his notes out of hand the more he owes the better but above all make him play he can't pay a shilling answered i the jews will not discount his notes at cent per cent so much the better you shall see we will make use of them answered the old gentleman and i must confess the plan he laid was a gallant clever and fair one i was to make my knee play in this there was no great difficulty we had an intimacy together for he was a good sportsman as well as myself and we came to have a pretty considerable friendship for one another if he saw a dice-box it was impossible to prevent him from handling it but he took to it as natural as a child does to sweetmeats at first he won of me then he began to lose then i played him money against some jewels that he brought family trinkets he said and indeed of considerable value he begged me however not to dispose of them in the duchy and i gave and kept my word to him to this effect from jewels he got to playing upon promissory notes and as they would not allow him to play at the court tables and in public upon credit he was very glad to have an opportunity of indulging his favorite passion in private i have had him for hours at my pavilion which i had fitted up in the eastern manner very splendid rattling the dice till it became time to go to his service at court and we would spend day after day in this manner he brought me more jewels a pearl necklace an antique emerald breast ornament and other trinkets as a set-off against these losses for i need not say that i should not have played with him all this time had he been winning but after about a week the luck set in against him and he became my debtor in a prodigious sum i do not care to mention the extent of it it was such as i thought the young man could never pay why then did i play for it why waste days in private play with a mere bankrupt when business seemingly much more profitable was to be done elsewhere my reason i boldly confess i wanted to win from m de Magny, not for his money but his intended wife the countess ida who can say that i had not a right to use any stratagem in this matter of love or why say love i wanted the wealth of the lady i loved her quite as much as Magny did i loved her quite as much as yonder blushing virgin of seventeen does who marries an old lord of seventy i followed the practice of the world in this having resolved that marriage should achieve my fortune i used to make Magny, after his losses give me a friendly letter of acknowledgment to some such effect as this my dear monsieur de baribari i acknowledge to have lost to you this day at lansconet or piquet or hazard as the case may be i was master of him at any game that is played the sum of three hundred ducats and shall hold it as a great kindness on your part if you will allow the debt to stand over until a future day when you shall receive payment from your very grateful humble servant with the jewels he brought me i also took the precaution but this was my uncle's idea and a very good one 
to have a sort of invoice and a letter begging me to receive the trinkets as so much part payment of a sum of money owed me when i had put him in such a position as i deemed favourable to my intentions i spoke to him candidly and without any reserve as one man of the world should speak to another i will not my dear fellow said i pay you so bad a compliment as to suppose that you expect we are to go on playing at this rate much longer and that there is any satisfaction to me in possessing more or less sheets of paper bearing your signature and a series of notes of hand which i know you can never pay don't look fierce or angry for you know redmond barry is your master at the sword besides i would not be such a fool as to fight a man who owes me so much money but hear calmly what i have to propose you have been very confidential to me during our intimacy of the last month and i know all your personal affairs completely you have given your word of honour to your grandfather never to play upon parole and you know how you have kept it and that he will disinherit you if he hears the truth nay suppose he dies to-morrow his estate is not sufficient to pay the sum in which you are indebted to me and were you to yield me up all you would be a beggar and a bankrupt too her highness the princess olivia denies you nothing i shall not ask why but give me leave to say i was aware of the fact when we began to play together will you be made uh, baron chamberlain with the grand cordon of the order gasped the poor fellow the princess can do anything with the duke i shall have no objection said i to the yellow ribbon and the gold key though a gentleman of the house of ballyberry cares little for the titles of the german nobility but this is not what i want my good chevalier you have hid no secrets from me you have told me with what difficulty you have induced the princess olivia to consent to the project of your union with the grafin ida whom you don't love i know whom you love very well monsieur de ballyberry said the discomfited chevalier he could get out no more the truth began to dawn upon him you begin to understand continued i her highness the princess i said this in a sarcastic way will not be very angry believe me if you break off your connection with the stupid countess i am no more of an admirer of that lady than you are but i want her estate i played you for that estate and have won it and i will give you your bills and five thousand ducats on the day i am married to it the day i am married to the countess answered the chevalier thinking to have me i will be able to raise money to pay your claim ten times over this was true for the countess's property may have been valued at near half a million of our money and then i will discharge my obligations to you meanwhile if you annoy me by threats or insult me again as you have done i will use that influence which as you say i possess and have you turned out of the duchy as you were out of the netherlands last year i rang the bell quite quietly zamor said i to a tall negro fellow habited like a turk that used to wait upon me when you hear the bell ring a second time you will take this packet to the marshal of the court uh, this to his excellency the general de Manny, and this you will place in the hands of one of the equerries of his highness the hereditary prince wait in the ante-room and do not go with the parcels until i ring again the black fellow having retired i returned to m de Manny, and said chevalier the first packet contains a letter from you to me declaring your solvency and solemnly promising payment of the sums you owe me it is accompanied by a document from yourself for i expected some resistance on your part stating that my honour has been called in question and begging that the paper may be laid before your august master his highness the second packet is for your grandfather enclosing the letter from you in which you state yourself to be his heir and begging for a confirmation of the fact the last parcel for his highness the hereditary duke added i looking most sternly contains the gustavus adolphus emerald which he gave to his princess and which you pledged to me as a family jewel of your own 
your influence with her highness must be very great indeed i concluded when you could extort from her such a jewel as that and when you could make her in order to pay your play debts give up a secret upon which both your heads depend villain said the frenchman quite aghast with fury and terror would you implicate the princess monsieur de magny i answered with a sneer no i will say you stole the jewel it was my belief he did and that the unhappy and infatuated princess was never privy to the theft until long after it had been committed how we came to know the history of the emerald is simple enough as we wanted money for my occupation with magny caused our bank to be much neglected my uncle had carried magny's trinkets to mannheim to pawn the jew who lent upon them knew the history of the stone in question and when he asked how her highness had come to part with it my uncle very cleverly took up the story where he found it said that the princess was very fond of play that it was not always convenient to her to pay and hence the emerald had come into our hands he brought it wisely back with him to s and as regards the other jewels which the chevalier pawned to us they were of no particular mark no inquiries have ever been made about them to this day and i did not only not know then that they came from her highness but have only my conjectures upon the matter now the unfortunate young gentleman must have had a cowardly spirit when i charged him with the theft not to make use of my two pistols that were lying by chance before him and to send out of the world his accuser and his own ruined self with such impudence and miserable recklessness on his part and that of the unhappy lady who had forgotten herself for this poor villain he must have known that discovery was inevitable but it was written that this dreadful destiny should be accomplished instead of ending like a man he now cowered before me quite spirit-broken and flinging himself down upon the sofa burst into tears calling wildly upon all the saints to help him as if they could be interested in the fate of such a wretch as he i saw that i had nothing to fear from him and calling back zamore my black said i would myself carry the parcels which i returned to my escritoire and my point being thus gained i acted as i always do generously towards him i said that for security's sake i should send the emerald out of the country but that i pledged my honour to restore it to the duchess without any pecuniary consideration on the day when she should procure the sovereign's consent to my union with the countess ida this will explain pretty clearly i flatter myself the game i was playing and though some rigid moralist may object to its propriety i say that everything is fair in love and that men so poor as myself can't afford to be squeamish about their means of getting on in life the great and rich are welcomed smiling up the grand staircase of the world the poor but aspiring must clamber up the wall or push and struggle up the back stair or pardi crawl through any conduits of the house never mind how foul and narrow that lead to the top the unambitious sluggard pretends that the eminence is not worth attaining declines altogether the struggle and calls himself a philosopher i i say he is a poor-spirited coward what is life good for but for honour and that is so indispensable that we should attain it anyhow the manner to be adopted for magny's retreat was proposed by myself and was arranged so as to consult the feelings of delicacy of both parties i made magny take the countess ida aside and say to her madam though i have never declared myself your admirer you and the court have had sufficient proof of my regard for you and my demand i know would have been backed by his highness your august guardian i know the duke's gracious wish is that my attentions should be received favourably but as time has not appeared to alter your attachment elsewhere and as i have too much spirit to force a lady of your name and rank to be united to me against your will the best plan is that i should make you for form's sake a proposal unauthorized by his highness that you should reply as i am sorry to think your heart dictates to you in the negative 
on which I also will formally withdraw from my pursuit of you, stating that, after a refusal, nothing, not even the Duke's desire, should induce me to persist in my suit. The Countess Ida almost wept at hearing these words from Monsieur de Magny, and tears came into her eyes, he said, as she took his hand for the first time and thanked him for the delicacy of the proposal. She little knew that the Frenchman was incapable of that sort of delicacy, and that the graceful manner in which he withdrew his addresses was of my invention. As soon as he withdrew it became my business to step forward, but cautiously and gently so as not to alarm the lady, and yet firmly so as to convince her of the hopelessness of her design of uniting herself with her shabby lover, the sub-lieutenant. The Princess Olivia was good enough to perform this necessary part of the plan in my favour, and solemnly to warn the Countess Ida that though Monsieur de Magny had retired from paying his addresses, His Highness her guardian would still marry her as he thought fit, and that she must forever forget her out-at-elbowed adorer. In fact, I can't conceive how such a shabby rogue as that could ever have had the audacity to propose to her. His birth was certainly good, but what other qualifications had he? When the Chevalier de Magny withdrew, numbers of other suitors, you may be sure, presented themselves, and amongst these your very humble servant, the Cadet of Ballyberry. There was a carousel, or tournament, held at this period, in imitation of the antique meetings of chivalry in which the Chevaliers tilted at each other, or at the ring and on this occasion I was habited in a splendid Roman dress, viz. a silver helmet, a flowing periwig, a cuirass of gilt leather richly embroidered, a light blue velvet mantle, and crimson Morocco half-boots. And in this habit I rode my bay horse, Brian, carried off three rings, and won the prize over all the Duke's gentry and the nobility of surrounding countries who had come to the show. A wreath of gilded laurel was to be the prize of the victor, and it was to be awarded by the lady he selected. So I rode up to the gallery where the Countess Ida was seated behind the hereditary princess, and calling her name loudly, yet gracefully, begged to be allowed to be crowned by her, and thus proclaimed myself to the face of all Germany, as it were, her suitor. She turned very pale, and the princess read, I observed, but the Countess Ida ended by crowning me. After which, putting spurs into my horse, I galloped round the ring, saluting His Highness the Duke at the opposite end, and performing the most wonderful exercises with my bay. My successes did not, as you may imagine, increase my popularity with the young gentry. They called me adventurer, bully, dice-loader, impostor, and a hundred pretty names, but I had a way of silencing these gentry. I took the Count de Schmetterling, the richest and bravest of the young men who seemed to have a hankering for the Countess Ida, and publicly insulted him at the Ridotto, flinging my cards into his face. The next day I rode thirty-five miles into the territory of the Elector of B, and met Monsieur de Schmetterling, and passed my sword twice through his body. Then rode back with my second, the Chevalier de Magny, and presented myself at the Duchess's whist that evening. Magny was very unwilling to accompany me at first, but I insisted upon his support, and that he should countenance my quarrel. Directly after paying my homage to Her Highness, I went up to the Countess Ida, and made her a marked and low obeisance, gazing at her steadily in the face until she grew crimson red, and then staring round at every man who formed her circle, until, ma foi, I stared them all away. I instructed Manny to say everywhere that the Countess was madly in love with me, which commission, along with many others of mine, the poor devil was obliged to perform. He made rather a sotte figure, as the French say, acting the pioneer for me, praising me everywhere, accompanying me always. He who had been the pink of the mud until my arrival, he who thought his pedigree of beggarly barons of Magny was superior to the race of great Irish kings from which I descended. 
who had sneered at me a hundred times as a spadassin, a deserter, and had called me a vulgar Irish upstart. Now I had my revenge of the gentleman, and took it, too. I used to call him, in the choicest societies, by his Christian name, Maxime. I would say, Bonjour, Maxime, comment vas-tu? in the princess's hearing, and could see him bite his lips for fury and vexation. But I had him under my thumb, and her highness, too. I, poor private of Bulow's regiment. And this is a proof of what genius and perseverance can do, and should act as a warning to great people never to have secrets, if they can help it. I knew the princess hated me, but what did I care? She knew I knew all, and indeed, I believe, so strong was her prejudice against me, that she thought I was an indelicate villain, capable of betraying a lady, which I would scorn to do, so that she trembled before me as a child before its schoolmaster. She would, in her woman's way, too, make all sorts of jokes and sneers at me on reception days ask about my palace in Ireland, and the kings my ancestors, and whether, when I was a private in Bulow's foot, my royal relatives had interposed to rescue me, and whether the cane was smartly administered there, anything to mortify me. But heaven bless you, I can make allowances for people, and used to laugh in her face. Whilst her jibes and jeers were continuing, it was my pleasure to look at poor Magny, and see how he bore them, the poor devil was trembling lest I should break out under the princess's sarcasm and tell all. But my revenge was, when the princess attacked me, to say something bitter to him, to pass it on as boys do at school. And that was the thing which used to make her highness feel. She would wince just as much when I attacked poor Magny as if I had been saying anything rude to herself. And, though she hated me, she used to beg my pardon in private and though her pride would often get the better of her, yet her prudence obliged this magnificent princess to humble herself to the poor, penniless Irish boy. As soon as Magny had formally withdrawn from the Countess Ida, the princess took the young lady into favor again, and pretended to be very fond of her. To do them justice, I don't know which of the two disliked me most, the princess, who was all eagerness and fire and coquetry, or the countess, who was all state and splendor. The latter especially pretended to be disgusted by me, and yet, after all, I have pleased her betters, was once one of the handsomest men in Europe, and would defy any hayduke of the court to measure a chest or a leg with me. But I did not care for any of her silly prejudices, and determined to win her and wear her in spite of herself. Was it on account of her personal charms or qualities? <laughs> no. She was quite white, thin, short-sighted, tall and awkward, and my taste is quite the contrary. And as for her mind, no wonder that a poor creature who had a hankering after a wretched, ragged ensign could never appreciate me. It was her estate I made love to. As for herself, it would be a reflection on my taste as a man of fashion to own that I liked her. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. In which the luck goes against Barry. My hopes of obtaining the hand of one of the richest heiresses in Germany were now, as far as all human probability went, and as far as my own merits and prudence could secure my fortune, pretty certain of completion. I was admitted whenever I presented myself at the princess's apartments, and had as frequent opportunities as I desired of seeing the Countess Ida there. I cannot say that she received me with any particular favor. The silly young creature's affections were, as I have said, engaged ignobly elsewhere. And however captivating my own person and manners may have been, it was not to be expected that she should all of a sudden forget her lover for the sake of the young Irish gentleman who was paying his addresses to her. But such little rebuffs as I got were far from discouraging me. I had very powerful friends, who were to aid me in my undertaking, 
and knew that sooner or later the victory must be mine in fact i only waited my time to press my suit who could tell the dreadful stroke of fortune which was impending over my illustrious protectress and which was to involve me partially in her ruin all things seemed for a while quite prosperous to my wishes and in spite of the countess ida's disinclination it was much easier to bring her to her senses than perhaps may be supposed in a silly constitutional country like england where people are not brought up with those wholesome sentiments of obedience to royalty which were customary in europe at the time when i was a young man i have stated how through mani i had the princess as it were at my feet her highness only had to press the match upon the old duke over whom her influence was unbounded and to secure the goodwill of the countess of liliengarten which was the romantic title of his highness's morganatic spouse and the easy old man would give an order for the marriage which his ward would perforce obey madame de liliengarten was too from her position extremely anxious to oblige the princess olivia who might be called upon any day to occupy the throne the old duke was tottering apoplectic and exceedingly fond of good living when he was gone his relict would find the patronage of the duchess olivia most necessary to her hence there was a close mutual understanding between the two ladies and the world said that the hereditary princess was already indebted to the favourite for help on various occasions her highness had obtained through the countess several large grants of money for the payment of her multifarious debts and she was now good enough to exert her gracious influence over madame de liliengarten in order to obtain for me the object so near my heart it is not to be supposed that my end was to be obtained without continual unwillingness and refusal on manie's part but i pushed my point resolutely and had means in my hands of overcoming the stubbornness of that feeble young gentleman also i may say without vanity that if the high and mighty princess detested me the countess though she was of extremely low origin it is said had better taste and admired me she often did us the honour to go partners with us in one of our faro banks and declared that i was the handsomest man in the duchy all i was required to prove was my nobility and i got at vienna such a pedigree as would satisfy the most greedy in that way in fact what had a man descended from the berries and the bradys to fear before any von in germany by way of making assurance doubly sure i promised madame de liliengarten ten thousand louis on the day of my marriage and she knew that as a playman i had never failed in my word and i vow that had i paid fifty per cent for it i would have got the money thus by my talents honesty and acuteness i had considering i was a poor patronless outcast raised for myself very powerful protectors even his highness the duke victor was favourably inclined to me for his favourite charger falling ill of the staggers i gave him a ball such as my uncle brady used to administer and cured the horse after which his highness was pleased to notice me more frequently he invited me to his hunting and shooting parties where i showed myself to be a good sportsman and once or twice he condescended to talk to me about my prospects in life lamenting that i had taken to gambling and that i had not adopted a more regular means of advancement sir said i if you will allow me to speak frankly to your highness play with me is only a means to an end where should i have been without it a private still in king frederick's grenadiers i come of a race which gave princes to my country but persecutions have deprived them of their vast possessions my uncle's adherence to his ancient faith drove him from our country i too resolved to seek advancement in the military service but the insolence and ill-treatment which i received at the hands of the english were not bearable by a high-born gentleman and i fled their service 
it was only to fall into another bondage to all appearance still more hopeless when my good star sent a preserver to me and my uncle and my spirit and gallantry enabled me to take advantage of the means of escape afforded me since then we have lived i do not disguise it by play but who can say i have done him a wrong yes if i could find myself in an honourable post and with an assured maintenance i would never accept for amusement such as every gentleman must have touch a card again i beseech your highness to inquire of your resident at berlin if i did not on every occasion act as a gallant soldier i feel that i have talents of a higher order and should be proud to have occasion to exert them if as i do not doubt my fortune shall bring them into play the candour of this statement struck his highness greatly and impressed him in my favour and he was pleased to say that he believed me and would be glad to stand my friend having thus the two dukes the duchess and the reigning favourite enlisted on my side the chances certainly were that i should carry off the great prize and i ought according to all common calculations to have been a prince of the empire at this present writing but that my ill luck pursued me in a manner in which i was not the least to blame the unhappy duchess's attachment to the weak silly cowardly frenchman the display of this love was painful to witness as its end was frightful to think of the princess made no disguise of it if Mani spoke a word to a lady of her household she would be jealous and attack with all the fury of her tongue the unlucky offender she would send him a half dozen of notes in the day at his arrival to join her circle or the courts which she held she would brighten up so that all might perceive it it was a wonder that her husband had not long ere this been made aware of her faithlessness but the prince victor was himself of so high and stern a nature that he could not believe in her stooping so far from her rank as to forget her virtue and i have heard say that when hints were given to him of the evident partiality which the princess showed for the equerry his answer was a stern command never more to be troubled on the subject the princess is light-minded he said she was brought up at a frivolous court but her folly goes not beyond coquetry crime is impossible she has her birth and my name and her children to defend her and he would ride off to his military inspections and be absent for weeks or retire to his suite of apartments and remain closeted there whole days only appearing to make a bow at her highness's levee or to give his hand at the court galas where ceremony required that he should appear he was a man of vulgar tastes and i have seen him in the private garden with his great ungainly figure running races or playing at ball with his little son and daughter whom he would find a dozen pretexts daily for visiting the serene children were brought to their mother every morning at her toilette but she received them very indifferently except on one occasion when the young duke ludwig got his little uniform as colonel of hussars being presented with a regiment by his godfather the emperor leopold then for a day or two the duchess olivia was charmed by the little boy but she grew tired of him speedily as a child does of a toy i remember one day in the morning circle some of the princess's rouge came off on the arm of her son's little white military jacket on which she slapped the poor child's face and sent him sobbing away oh the woes that have been worked by women in this world the misery into which men have lightly stepped with smiling faces often not even with the excuse of passion but from mere foppery vanity and bravado men play with these dreadful two-edged tools as if no harm could come to them i who have seen more of life than most men if i had a son would go on my knees to him and beg him to avoid woman who is worse than poison once intrigue and your whole life is endangered you never know when the evil may fall upon you 
and the woe of whole families and the ruin of innocent people perfectly dear to you may be caused by a moment of your folly when i saw how entirely lost the unlucky monsieur de Magny seemed to be in spite of all the claims i had against him i urged him to fly he had rooms in the palace in the garrets over the princess's quarters the building was a huge one and accommodated almost a city of noble retainers of the family but the infatuated fool would not budge although he had not even the excuse of love for staying how she squints he would say of the princess and how crooked she is she thinks no one can perceive her deformity she writes me verses out of Gresset or crebillon and fancies i believe them to be original bah they are no more her own than her hair is it was in this way that the wretched lad was dancing over the ruin that was yawning under him i do believe that his chief pleasure in making love to the princess was that he might write about his victories to his friends of the petite maison at paris where he longed to be considered as a wit and a vainqueur de dame seeing the young man's recklessness and the danger of his position i became very anxious that my little scheme should be brought to a satisfactory end and pressed him warmly on the matter my solicitations with him were i need not say from the nature of the connection between us generally pretty successful and in fact the poor fellow could refuse me nothing as i used often laughingly to say to him very little to his liking but i used more than threats or the legitimate influence i had over him i used delicacy and generosity as a proof of which i may mention that i promised to give back to the princess the family emerald which i mentioned in the last chapter that i had won from her unprincipled admirer at play this was done by my uncle's consent and was one of the usual acts of prudence and foresight which distinguish that clever man press the matter now redmond my boy he would urge this affair between her highness and Mani must end ill for both of them and that soon and where will be your chance to win the countess then now is your time win her and wear her before the month is over and we will give up the punting business and go live like noblemen at our castle in Sfabia. get rid of that emerald too he added should an accident happen it will be an ugly deposit found in our hand this it was that made me agree to forego the possession of the trinket which i must confess i was loath to part with it was lucky for us both that i did as you shall presently hear meanwhile then i urged many i spoke strongly to the countess of liliengarten who promised formally to back my claim with his highness the reigning duke and monsieur de Mani was instructed to induce the princess olivia to make a similar application to the old sovereign in my behalf it was done the two ladies urged the prince his highness at a supper of oysters and champagne was brought to consent and her highness the hereditary princess did me the honour of notifying personally to the countess ida that it was the prince's will that she should marry the young irish nobleman the chevalier redmond de balibarri the notification was made in my presence and though the young countess said never and fell down in a swoon at her lady's feet i was you may be sure entirely unconcerned at this little display of mawkish sensibility and felt indeed now that my prize was secure that evening i gave the chevalier de Magny the emerald which he promised to restore to the princess and now the only difficulty in my way lay with the hereditary prince of whom his father his wife and the favourite were alike afraid he might not be disposed to allow the richest heiress in his duchy to be carried off by a noble though not a wealthy foreigner time was necessary in order to break the matter to prince victor the princess must find him at some moment of good humour he had days of infatuation still when he could refuse his wife nothing and our plan was to wait for one of these or for any other chance which might occur 
but it was destined that the princess should never see her husband at her feet, as often he had been. Fate was preparing a terrible ending to her follies, and my own hope. In spite of his solemn promises to me, Magny never restored the emerald to the Princess Olivia. He had heard, in casual intercourse with me, that my uncle and I had been beholden to Mr. Moses Lowe, the banker of Heidelberg, who had given us a good price for our valuables, and the infatuated young man took a pretext to go thither, and offered the jewel for pawn. Moses Lowe recognized the emerald at once, gave Manny the sum the latter demanded, which the chevalier lost presently at play, never, you may be sure, acquainting us with the means by which he had made himself master of so much capital. We, for our parts, supposed that he had been supplied by his usual banker, the princess, and many rouleaux of his gold pieces found their way into our treasury, when, at the court galas, at our own lodgings, or at the apartments of Madame de Liliengarten, who on these occasions did us the honour to go halves with us, we held our bank of faro. Thus Manny's money was very soon gone. But though the Jew held his jewel, of thrice the value, no doubt, of the sums he had lent upon it, that was not all the profit which he intended to have from his unhappy creditor, over whom he began speedily to exercise his authority. His Hebrew connections at X, money-brokers, bankers, horse-dealers, about the court there, must have told their Heidelberg brother what Manny's relations with the princess were, and the rascal determined to take advantage of these, and to press to the utmost both victims. My uncle and I were, meanwhile, swimming upon the high tide of fortune, prospering with our cards, and with the still greater matrimonial game which we were playing, and we were quite unaware of the mine under our feet. Before a month was passed, the Jew began to pester Manny. He presented himself at X, and asked for future interest hush money. Otherwise he must sell the emerald. Manny got money for him. The princess again befriended her dastardly lover. The success of the first demand only rendered the second more exorbitant. I do not know how much money was extorted and paid on this unlucky emerald, but it was the cause of the ruin of us all. One night we were keeping our table as usual at the Countess of Liliengarten's, and Manny being in cash somehow, kept drawing out rouleau after rouleau, and playing with his common ill success. In the middle of the play, a note was brought into him which he read and turned very pale on perusing. But the luck was against him, and looking up rather anxiously at the clock, he waited for a few more turns of the cards, when having, I suppose, lost his last rouleau, he got up with a wild oath that scared some of the polite company assembled, and left the room. A great trampling of horses was heard without but we were too much engaged with our business to heed the noise, and continued our play. Presently someone came into the playroom and said to the countess, Here is a strange story. A Jew has been murdered in the Kaiserwald. Manny was arrested when he went out of the room. All the party broke up on hearing this strange news, and we shut up our bank for the night. Manny had been sitting by me during the play. My uncle dealt, and I paid and took the money. And, looking under his chair, there was a crumpled paper which I took up and read. It was that which had been delivered to him, and ran thus. If you have done it, take the orderly's horse who brings this. It is the best of my stable. There are a hundred louis in each holster, and the pistols are loaded. Either course lies open to you, if you know what I mean. In a quarter of an hour I shall know our fate, whether I am to be dishonoured and survive you, whether you are guilty and a coward, or whether you are still worthy of the name of M. This was in the handwriting of the old General de Manny, and my uncle and I, as we walked home at night, having made and divided with the Countess Lilingard and no inconsiderable profits that night, felt our triumphs greatly dashed by the perusal of the letter. 
has many we asked robbed the jew or has his intrigue been discovered in either case my claims on the countess ida were likely to meet with serious drawbacks and i began to feel that my great card was played and perhaps lost well it was lost though i say to this day it was well and gallantly played after supper which we never for fear of consequences took during play i became so agitated in my mind as to what was occurring that i determined to sally out about midnight into the town and to inquire what was the real motive of manie's apprehension a sentry was at the door and signified to me that i and my uncle were under arrest we were left in our quarters for six weeks so closely watched that escape was impossible had we desired it but as innocent men we had nothing to fear our course of life was open to all and we desired and courted inquiry great and tragical events happened during those six weeks of which though we heard the outline as all europe did when we were released from our captivity we were yet far from understanding all the particulars which were not much known to me for many years after here they are as they were told to me by the lady who of all the world was perhaps the most likely to know them but the narrative had best form the contents of another chapter end of chapter eleven